Good evening, wherever you're from uh, and what time of the day it is. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this brand new speaker series. Um, the kind of context for this, I, I think, is the context that we're all operating in or um, trying to make sense of right now. Um, on one hand, we have, you know, seen this kind of black swan event illuminate uh, a kind of um, set of uh, disparities within different contexts, peoples and societies. Um, disparities in access to primary health care, uh, disparity in um, um, access to communication technologies, uh, a whole set of um, complex things which uh, make you feel not so great about the world that we're in. Uh, at the same time, we've seen amazing creativity, uh, um, uh, collaboration, innovation in ways that aren't an extension of the past, uh, but uh, breaks from the past, uh, reconsiderations, re in, re rethinking of the kinds of worlds that we want to be in. Uh, and this is the kind of context of um, what uh, brings us uh, into this conversation today. And we thought there was no one uh, better to begin this conversation than um, um, Kenneth Goldsmith. Uh, he has a history uh, of thinking about this tension um, uh, between creativity and originality. Um, this idea of uh, collective, uh, um, collective originality. And in uncreative writing in 2011, uh, what he did is that not only did he foresee some of the central um, uh, definitional categories of what the world that we operate in today, uh, but he located a different sense of agency and transformation uh, within the chaos uh, kind of potentiality. Um, uh, and in this dynamic between, you know, what is art, uh, what is the text and what is digital technologies, um, uh, he not only um, offered us concepts, uh, principles of intervention, but also pedagogical uh, approaches to how we teach people um, how they how they communicate uh, and the forms in which they communicate in. Um, so it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce him. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what he thinks 10 years on uh, of what was the power of this work, um, what's its um, continuing context and how we can use it to understand um, uh, transformative potentials within the everyday. So um, over to you. Okay, well, thanks for that introduction. Where are you, by the way? Uh, I am in Champaign, Illinois. Um, and and where? In Champaign, Illinois. Oh, Illinois. Yes, um, you can tell from my accent that is where I am from. And <laughs> I, I spent 20 minutes thinking, do you square the frame of a bookcase or do you put it on the angle? Uh, and, and I don't know whether you can answer that, um, that, that, new visual trope that we're trying to negotiate with. You look good. It, it, I, I think mine's sort of on an angle. But the <laughs> thing I love watching is all those people on CNN, you know, or MSNBC that haven't given any consideration into their background at all. And you're seeing dirty laundry and, you know, well, horrible. Yes, yes. And, 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 and one of the things that I want to know is why so often they choose the kitchen as the background. Because they're yeah. not thinking, they're not thinking about anything, and it also, you know, it it, it shows you, you know, the, how badly these people live. You know, <laughs> truly, they look so great and and beautiful on TV, and 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 you see their homes, and they're living in absolute, you know, absolute shitholes. <laughs> it's not about poverty; it's about aesthetics. I mean, they obviously yeah. have money, but it's like you see so many bad choices. Yes, 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 but, very. Bad. Bad art purchases are a, 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 a common theme. But look, if you can see, I have chosen something good to be behind me, which is yeah, your I, cap. I think, you put, I think you put that there for the show. That's not nice, though. So you're thinking about <laughs> well, that. no, look, 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 truthfully, I did move it up from lower so we could yeah, see it. <laughs> I think it looks gorgeous there. I have, I have a copy of it, uh, uh, the same book right here. It's a good book. <laughs> 
So, okay, so all right, so we'll, I have about a half hour to talk about yes, yes. 10 years on? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, um, so for those of you who are not familiar uh, with this concept or with this book, uh, it's called Uncreative Writing, uh, published in 2011. Um, it was really a response to what it means to be a writer in the digital age. Um, and um, I guess just for, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I'll just read uh, the first paragraph and you'll get the basic idea. Uh, in 1969, the conceptual artist Douglas Hubler wrote, quote, the world is full of objects more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more, unquote. I've come to embrace Hubler's ideas, though it might be retooled as, quote, the world is full of texts more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more, unquote. It seems an appropriate response to the new condition in writing today. Faced with an unprecedented amount of available text, the problem is not needing to write any more of it. Instead, we must learn to negotiate the vast quantity that exists. How I make my way through this thicket of information, how I manage it, how I parse it, how I organize it and distribute it is what distinguishes my writing from yours. Okay, so that's the first part. That's, that's the basic thesis of the book. Um, and then uh, as Philip was saying, this does deal with uh, notions of originality. And so just to dip into a short portion of the second paragraph, uh, the literary critic Marjorie Perloff has recently begun using the term unoriginal genius to describe this tendency emerging in literature. Her idea is that because of changes brought on by technology and the internet, our notion of genius, a romantic isolated figure is outdated. An updated notion of genius would have to center around one's mastery of information and its dissemination. Perloff has coined a term, moving information to signify both the act of pushing language around as well as the act of being emotionally uh, uh, moved by that process. She posits today that, that today's writer resembles more programmer than a tortured genius, brilliantly conceptualizing, constructing, executing, and maintaining a writing machine. Okay, so that's, um, that's the, the thesis here. Um, um, what do I wanna say? I wanna say that uh, those ideas developed uh, over the course of two decades, uh, I didn't touch a computer until I was uh, 34 years old in 19, whatever the fuck <laughs> year that is. I don't even wanna say. Um, but I, when I got on the internet, um, I had been writing this book, it's right here. It's this big book. Um, and this was published in 1997. And it basically takes the structure of the rhyming dictionary, okay? That's, and everything rhymes um, and it's all alphabetized. And I decided a rhyming dictionary for those of you that don't know is a, a dictionary where uh, words are organized not according to meaning, but according to sound. So it was really used for poets. Uh, uh, and then I guess when I started listening to hip hop in the eighties, I, I rediscovered the rhyming dictionary and I, I think probably rappers were using it as well. Um, to write this book is just a compilation. I just, just took a few sounds and I, I, I began collecting the sounds and then organizing them according to uh, alphabetizing them and alphabetization and syllables. Okay, so it, it was kind of a pre-programmed machine that went into writing this book. That was the kind of work I was doing at this time. Um, and before the internet, I would just kind of go around with a pen, pencil and a piece of paper and I'd be sitting um, like in movies, listening for my sounds. I wasn't really listening to the narrative of the movies. I was listening for like the, the weird sound. And then if I'd hear the sound, I'd, I'd write down the sentence that came with the sound. And I'd sit there just kind of transcribing the whole environment around me. If I'm reading a newspaper, and in those days we read paper newspapers, I'd, 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 I'd copy things with those sounds in it. And then I'd organize them and put them into Microsoft Word. and um, and um, sort of store them in, to make a big book like this. One day in 19, I guess it must have been 1993, I was sitting at my kitchen table and um, I was on uh, the nascent internet, uh, which was a Unix interface called Lynx, uh, a web browser, L-Y-N-X. Uh, at that time, there was no graphical web. 
And um, I was kind of plummeting strange early websites that I, some of the earliest stuff on the web at that point was like they had they had digitized um, skating uh, zines and they were very, very beautiful. The language in the skating zines was incredible using leet and all of that stuff. And so I, there was this, I began like grabbing or, or reading these things and, 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 and retyping them into Microsoft Word document, getting my stuff from the internet, just like I was getting it from the movies. And then one day I was sitting at the kitchen table and you know, I still do this, but you know, if you're on Chrome or Safari and you, I have a nerve, nervous habit of highlighting the text, you know, with my, with my cursor. And then you can kind of like drag the text around the page. You know, I don't know if you, if you do that, but it's kind of a shadow thing. And you can actually kind of grab a chunk of text and move it around. And I was moving, and you could do that in the Unix uh, window as well. And so I was just highlighting this text and then dragging it around and suddenly it dropped into my Microsoft Word document. I was like, what the fuck just happened, right? I was like, wait, all of this on the internet can actually go into this Microsoft Word document? And when it went into my Microsoft Word document, it came in in the same font and the same format. And I thought, oh my God, this looks like I wrote it, but I didn't write it at all, but I did write it. You know, and this became like the central uh, concern of mine. I said, I've been sitting here kind of collecting all this information with pencil. And now, you know, my notion of what writing is, all of this is available. All I have to do is start to push this stuff around and organize it. And the great thing about working with language is that it always has meaning. We don't have to worry about meaning, right? Uh, I took kind of took a formal approach to language because I figured no matter what I put into the uh, uh, whatever, whatever I chose was going to be full of meaning anyway. That's the beauty of language. Um, and that was the kind of moment from 93. And then I began to theorize this and began to think that, wow, writing may never be the same again. What you own, what you produce, you know, all sorts of things that writing kind of never really dealt with in a, in a deep way um, were now all up for grabs in a really, really radical way, probably similar to the way that painting was up for grabs when photography came. I thought, well, this is really, this is writing's moment, right? Where it meets a technology that's so much better at doing what it had been trying to do that it changes the fucking game altogether. So, you know, just as so, so painting's mode in the late 19th century was, you know, uh, up until the camera, mid 1840s, 1850s was representation. Now here comes a machine that can do a much better representation than any painter can do. So in order for painting to survive, the game had to change. And the game changed then to, uh, well, what can the camera not do? And so hence you have uh, impressionism, right? Blurry, out of focus stuff. The camera was like, you know, which leads us into abstraction, which leads us into cubism, which leads us into surrealism and futurism and all of those things and all those isms of the 20th century. I just thought, well, this is the moment really in which writing is now receiving its challenge the same way because uh, writing hadn't really met its challenge. Writing's crisis imitated painting's crisis. So when Gertrude Stein began to write like a quote cubist, that really wasn't her crisis. Writing wasn't having the same problem that painting was. It was imitative of Picasso, but it wasn't the authentic in the same way that Picasso's was. And um, I thought, I mean, we all love Gertrude Stein, we get it. But there's a part of me that thinks that maybe the reason that kind of experimental writing never really took root in the 20th century was because um, it, was, it hadn't experienced an authentic crisis. You know, you could say the telegraph or the newspaper, the news line, you know, all nudged painting, but it, uh, writing, but it didn't really produce the same crisis that the camera did to painting. So now, anyway, with the internet, we, we kind of came up with our own crisis. The problem was that nobody seemed to really acknowledge it, you know, and writing, you know, the, if you look at the novels, I mean, I think, I think I've written somewhere that Jonathan Franzen is America's greatest novelist of the 1950s, right? I mean, you know, this kind of, this kind of um, change hasn't registered in writing. If you look today at the Man Booker Prize, there's no, sense that this is being written, you know, in the writing itself, 
you know, on, on the fastest, craziest machines ever invented. Uh, you know, sometimes I think, well, how come airport no novels you don't buy an airport? Why don't they have glitches? You know, we're living in a glitch society. There's no trace of it. Of course, they're all using the internet. They're all on their cell phones in these novels, but the writing itself is unimpacted at all by this radical technology. And to me, that's a total failure. I mean, you know, writing has got its head in the sand. And those books that keep winning those prizes keep, you know, basically, you know, I, I say I'm uncreative, but I actually think that, the, that all of those man Booker Prize writers, they're really the uncreative ones. This is the most formulaic shit I've ever seen. And all they want to do is get those books made into movies. And there's a way to do that. And you can figure that out and you can play that pretty easily. Okay. So to me, this is not literature. You know, this is not literature at all. This is not addressing our world. This is not addressing uh, a crisis. It, 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 it's something else. I know it exists. And here's the thing, 10 years down the line, I mean, I've been, I've been taught, saying this for 15 years and I've been saying it on some really loud platforms like Stephen Colbert or the White House. Okay, I've been to those, I've been to those places talking these same ideas. And quite frankly, I don't think my thinking has made a single dent in anyone's consciousness, except for, you know, Philip and uh, Tamsin and our six friends, you know? So to me, there still kind of truly exists an avant-garde. Um, and um, that's kind of exciting. But the scary part 10 years down the line is that, um, is that Donald Trump on Twitter is actually en enacting everything that I predicted in this book. Okay, it's, 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 not, it's not really, you know, in Trump, it's not as much about the content as it's about the citation. We live in a world of citations and he's really rather brilliant at, at exploiting, you know, those things. Of course, Donald Trump hasn't read my book, though Michelle Obama, who invited me to the White House, I believe has, or at least she's heard my ideas. So, you know, that's, there's your, your difference in administration, but then again, no poets have been invited to the White House uh, over the past four years. So that's a, a sort of a no brainer. But the point is that I think um, what has happened, what I was theorizing in uncreative writing 10 years ago has become a total monster and it's become the internet and it's become social media and it's become so refractive and re reflexive in ways that I couldn't have imagined that I, you know, I always thought that, you know, I always thought, I kind of looked at it through a modernist lens. And I thought that writing today has to imitate the computer in which it's being written on. Therefore, the writing will not be abstract the way that painting was, the writing will be refractive the way the internet is and reflective and reflexive and reflective and you know, disseminated and not sure who's writing what, um, who the actual author is, this challenges notions of Barth's uh, death of the author in really interesting ways. Well, this has just completely exploded, as we know, with you know, fake news and, and, and bots and uh, 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 interventions and you know, all, of the, you know, all of the other things. Um, and so I kind of predicted it and I kind of uh, didn't, couldn't see the monster that it became. And I also creatively, it became a monster as well. This book gave a lot of people permission to cut and paste anything and call it writing, call it poetry. And boy, did, am I responsible for a lot of bad art um, as well. You know, uh, it, 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 it's the hardest thing in the world to actually be an uncreative writer. But then again, it's also, if you don't really understand it, it's the easiest thing in the world as well. And I, you know, I can't kind of um, get behind most people, you know, every day in my mail, you know, for years, I get books where people just basically cut the internet and put it into a print on demand edition, which I really love the idea, but I don't, I don't think it's good art. I think it's actually quite lazy. And in order to be good at this, I guess after Duchamp, if you want to call something art, it's art. I can't say that it's not art, uh, but if you, I'm not, I can't say that it's good art. Anybody can make art and anything can be art, but not anything is good art. Okay, and good art is really hard to make. And I love the democracy, the notion of democracy that anyone can be an artist like Joseph Boyes said. On the other hand, not anyone can be a good artist. Okay, and so I kind of like, 
you know, it's kind of like what happened with uh, pop art, let's say. You know, it was really hard to be Andy Warhol. And, and Andy Warhol, you know, pop art spun off the worst art on the planet. Be why was Warhol so good? And why was so much of the art that followed after Warhol so bad? I'm not saying I'm so good, but I'm just saying as an, sort of an architect of a system of, of creativity, um, you just have to sort of take responsibility for that. Um, and so, I, you know, I still believe it. Of my own writing practice uh, over the past 10 years, I've come to an end. I don't really write anymore because when you've given yourself permission to copy and paste and reprint the entire internet, what's the point? And I did a project in 2013 called Printing the Internet, Printing Out the Internet, in which I, I put calls out on social media around the world for everybody to print a little bit of the internet and send it to a gallery in Mexico. And thousands of people around the world did that. And we displayed it. And for one day, I think we got the whole internet printed. But of course, the next day, more internet came and it was just very a dialectical constellation as Walter Benjamin would put it. It, it kind of blew apart very quickly the next day. So um, I think also the revelations over the past 10 years of, of the NSA and I think Shoshana Zuboff's surveillance capitalism um, uh, is exactly uncreative writing used in really nasty ways. Um, I think that the NSA um, was about volume. And I think like even what I said in this book in the very beginning, uh, there's, there's too much now. Uh, what's too much? There was so much uh, downloaded from the NSA from Snowden that nobody could actually read the whole thing. Nothing was read of it at all. I did a project recently in Venice where I printed all of Hillary Clinton's emails, the ones that were, you know, 46,000, you know, the famous emails, I printed them out. And I actually decided to sit down and try to read them. Um, and I got through about 2,500 of them. There were 46,000, I think. And, or, you know, 30,000, something like that. And I was exhausted. It took me forever just to read the 2,500. On the other hand, the quantity of data only makes artificial intelligence, quote, smarter. Um, so the, the volume uh, uh, that's fed into art artificial intelligence um, teaches it. So the more you can shovel into an AI engine, the smarter that that engine can be. But then again, I don't think it's so smart because AI only knows what it's been fed, okay? So AI doesn't, it can't be perverse. It can't be, you know, it, 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 let's just say, let's, I, there's many things it can't be, but let's just take perversity. You know, AI can't understand perversity at all. It's way too complicated for it. Um, um, there's all sorts of things that, that AI can't do. So what AI engines end up being trained on just simply reifies more of the man booker mentality. They're being trained on blog posts and, you know, Amazon catalogs and social media posts, which are all written in normative language and completely being unaware of the medium. I just wanted to be aware of the medium in my time. You know, like, it's like kind of bitching about corporate culture on Facebook, which people do all the time. And I'm like, don't you know that you're on the biggest corporation in the world bitching about corporate culture? How naive are you? Stop it, you know, just, just open your eyes to the infrastructure. And, you know, I mean, I'm a structuralist. I, I, believe, in, I believe in examining structures. Uh, I believe that, 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 that we're very, very good at using the internet and we're horrible at theorizing it, okay? It's never been theorized. And I think that's this is a problem for, for, maybe I could theorize it because I'm gonna be 60 years old, okay? And I, I, I remember the world uh, before there was an internet, like, like many of us do. And then we can, wow, begin to kind of step back, objectify it and theorize it. But my son, let's say who's 21 or my other son who's 15, they don't theorize it, you know, they just use it. But it, but with tel it happened with television. It took Marshall McLuhan, somebody who grew up in a time before television to theorize television because he was outside of it. As uh, growing up in the 1960s, I just watched television. There's no way I could theorize it because I was too deep inside of it. So it takes the previous generation to, uh, you know, the distance in order to theorize um, the, the latest technology. And uh, happily or unhappily, I think I, uh, many of us in our generation uh, uh, got, uh, were able to theorize the internet uh, in ways that, that people who really use it all the time don't. So um, 
I think we're almost at the end of the half hour. And, uh, uh, you know, I just want to say that, yeah, so I, 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 I moved on. I couldn't keep going. I made giant books and many of them are on the shelves here of uncreative writing. I published something like 30 books and then I just kind of hit an end. I thought, well, I've done this, you know? And unlike a painter, you know, painters, they do one thing forever because they have great markets. And if they, if they change their style at all, um, you know, the market gets upset and they, they won't sell anything. We poets don't have that problem. So I could, you know, I could continue to kind of publish these books, but I, start, I stopped seeing really a need to do it anymore. And it was kind of good. It kind of wound up what I would say is at, when I stopped really doing this kind of writing, it wound up 20 years of an investigation. That investigation was beginning at the turn of the century, what does it mean to be a writer in the digital age? Okay, we're well into the century now. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the 20s already. So to, you know, either, you know the, the ideas are out there for those who are interested in it. The ideas are being spun in other ways all over the web in ways that are much larger, as I said, much more problematic than I ever predicted. And um, so, yeah, I'm kind of like, I, I, I'm kind of done, done with that now. Um, and that it was a kind of an amazing journey. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good place to end. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, Tamsin, just wanna just check, um, should I jump in with the first question now or is there someone waiting there? Um, if you jump in for, with the first question, uh, the chat box is open for everyone so they can put their um, questions in there and I can help facilitate that. Yeah, so the, the, the um, first thing that I uh, wanna ask you and you know, I, I, as I re, re, re read um, your text as well is I got the sense of where you ended up as a kind of question, which is, you know, in so much of what you were doing, there seemed like there was a hope within um, what digital communications or what the brand new infrastructure of communication could be for, you know, transforming um, how we write and in turn how we think and how we act. Uh, do we get to a point where we write off the medium of all the things that were unpredicted and and um, is there something unique about digital technologies that wasn't the same with the canvas? The canvas was an infrastructure, painting survived, canvas was, you know, canvas and paintbrushes, they're unquestioned as the infrastructure and they are still productive. Um, um, do you think that, that the kind of digital infrastructure today has become so um, self, reflective, not self-reflexive, but so self-reflective that it's impossible to uh, escape um, what are the kind of corporate um, commodifying undertones of the infrastructure? Yeah, well, I, you know, listen, new writing continues to be produced every day <laughs> and at, at, at great, uh, uh, you know, at, in, gr in great quantities. Um, I don't think that, that this is stopping anything uh, as a matter of fact, I, you know, um, this is why I'm interested in AI, because AI will begin to produce so much more writing than any human can. Um, you know, I met this guy uh, who was, who was a, a computer scientist at, at this conference, and this guy had been training machines to write exactly like, like in proper English. And what he would do is he would just feed a bunch of statistics into this machine and uh, it would spit out something that looked like it was written by a person. And it was absolutely amazing. It was, um, you know, he could take like a, a, a stats from a baseball game and then push a button and it writes a report, you know, like writes the, 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 the thing you read in the newspaper the next day. Yes. Uh, which I thought was incredible. Um, and then, you know, I, I introduced my process of uncreative writing to him. And it was just so bizarre. He said, but why would you want to write like a machine? You know? And um, so, you know, I think it's so perverse and so beautiful to want to write like a machine, but when the machine, it, when the machine doesn't have perversity, and I keep using this thing, by the way, it's not perversion. I don't want to say that I'm perverted. Perversion and perversity are two different things. Just to make it clear that I'm not 
advocate being a pervert. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing, there's, there's, I think actually kind of writing like that for capital is sort of perverted because it's just so, so singular in its intention. It has nothing at all to do with the perversity of, of, of training a machine. Again, it's ignoring the infrastructure, focusing on the product, which, you know, can be sold and, 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 and paid for. So anyway, to answer your question, I always had a dream that um, I could never do this. Like I always wrote these books. I always put my name on it. I always made sure that the books were really good. I always made sure that they had a really good concept. You know, I always thought that the machine that wrote the, that wrote the book had to be better than the book itself. And then the book itself had to be really interesting. And the kind of notion of conceptual literature was that the idea was better than the actual result in text, but that was a bit of a falsehood. The text actually had to be really good as well. Okay, otherwise the whole thing would fall apart. I think this is what a lot of people ended up missing um, in that. And sometimes it took a little bit of monkeying to get a good text. You know, I mean, this is what the surrealists never told you is that those texts are so good because they went in and they fixed them. They wrote in the unconscious and then they edited the hell out of them. They said, but no, this sprung from my brow while I was sleepwalking. This is the secret. Ulipo, every literary, you know, John Cage, all sorts of mechanical writing, they all went in and monkeyed with it a little bit to make it better than it was. Um, and I did that in some of my books as well. You know, it's just I, what the machine gives you is just not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I still, you know, anyway, the point is finally to get to the point. I always envisioned that there would be a group of people who didn't care as much as I did. And actually it was, would have been really cool as an anti art gesture to say, to say I'm gonna fucking publish this thing. It has no literary value at all. It's, <laughs> I'm just publishing, I'm just publishing, I'm just doing this. All the things that I kind of old fashioned care about, good art, good ideas, good, you know, great book, my name on the cover. How about, you know, my name on the cover of these books? I mean, you know, people would say, but you know, you're an uncreative writer. Why do you still have your name on it? You know, so I kind of, you know, I'm kind of a bit old fashioned in those ways. Yeah, and I right. dreamed that it would, that it would kind of explode, but it took a, it, writing took a very different turn and it took a very conservative turn. It took an identitarian turn. It took a useful turn, a socially useful turn because the times have demanded um, a response to, to terrible trespasses. And so I actually think that, you know, again, the, the literary landscape to me right now reminds me of the 1930s, you know, socially useful work written in a, in a popular style uh, that, that people can understand and things like the avant-garde um, are being uh, villainized and, and demonized as being elitist and irrelevant. Uh, but then again, um, you know, I always thought that, that art's role was not to solve problems, but to ask, ask questions. Okay, done, sorry, that was a long answer. I won't answer the rest that long. <laughs> so I'm just gonna read out the questions in order that they're coming up here. So as not to have any particular preference. Um, so the first question for Kenneth, it says, uh, writing and images are so closely connected on the internet in social media particularly, but generally across the, the web and news media. What does this mean for writing? Well, the thing that, that, that we tend to forget about images is that they're all made out, out, up out of text on the digital images. So they're it, totally inextricable. And so I'm gonna just say that, you know, you ever receive, and you know, particularly in the early days of email, when an Im somebody sent an image and it didn't render right, and you open up your email and there's just miles and miles and miles of alphanumeric code, okay? That's your image unprocessed. And so actually, you know, right under the surface of all of our images and all of our um, video and all of our uh, sound is actually language. It's all being propelled by language under the hood. And so I thought this, again, this is more of a reason they're absolutely intertwined, but of course, nobody's thinking about that. I have this little um, demonstration that I used to show where you can take like a JPEG of Shakespeare, right? Take an image of Shakespeare and you can change the, file extension from JPEG to TXT, and you can open that image up in a uh, text editor and it comes in as text. And then you can take the entire works of William Shakespeare, everything he ever wrote with three, with, with a copy and paste and drop it into 
the code of that image and then you could save it and then rename it as a JPEG and open it up. And you'll find that Shakespeare's language has altered his image in un unbelievable kind of glitchy ways. Now you can't do that. I mean, you try to take a conventional photograph, <laughs> you know, you peel it back and there was just emulsion. You try to stuff like language into it. You take like a, a book and try to shove it into underneath a, 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 a frame, a, 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 a paper print, it doesn't work. This is an extraordinary time for writing because everything that happens on the web is writing. Okay, so I think they're, it's a very good point. I think they're inextricably intertwined though nobody wants to admit it. Everybody thinks a photograph is actually a photograph. <laughs> you know, you, and there's nothing more to it than that. Um, there was a great um, um, uh, uh, early internet piece called um, Microsoft Word. It looks like you're writing a letter. Right? We're just writing love letters on Microsoft Word when in fact we're doing so much more than that. But yet it, we, it, we might as well be with a quill pen for all our, our, our ignorance. Um, the next question that I have here, I'm not sure if it's a question or more of a statement or I'm just gonna throw it out here but from Adnan. Um, how about the notion of shame if not perversity? Well, I don't know. Isn't the internet just a shame machine? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's plenty of that to go around. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, we've all been shamed on the internet. That's for sure. Though I can't, I can't really say what it has to do with art, other than to say that, like, when I was, I've been shamed, uh, and it, and it. At, uh, on the internet and um, you know it, it makes it, it it shakes you you know it shakes it shakes you it makes you scared it makes you scared to do the to do the things that you need to do um, I don't I'm not so sure that that um, it's such a you know sometimes I think being on the internet is such a good place for artists for example a painter is in their studio all day and they're painting they're alone at the end of the day they take a little snapshot of the painting they're working on and post it on social media and they get a lot of likes and they feel really good. They can get back into the studio the next day. And every, you know, this never happened before because painters are the loneliest people in the world and their studios all alone. On the other hand, uh, you, can, you can put something up on the internet and get shamed and never want to pick up a pen again. So, uh, or, you know, ne never want to never want to do anything again. So uh, I think we've all experienced that. Um, I think sometimes it's really best for us to to, to stay away from the internet, uh, not to share, uh, you know, that's how I'm, anyway, during the pandemic, that's how I'm feeling. I've kind of gotten off social media during the pandemic. Um, I, I th think it's been a very good time for artists to go inside themselves. You know, we're driven so much by external goals and publishing and talks and all this stuff. And I even, uh, when, 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 when Tamsin invited me, I said, no, I'm really into my own head. Uh, I want to be really private right now. Thank you for your invitation. Um, and then, you know, then I think I was getting a little too cloistered. So I thought it was, thank you for drawing me out of my shell. It's so cozy in our shell now. If we can, by the way, if you have the privilege to be in your shell, you know, many people don't. And it's a very hard time for, for so many people. And I think it's a hard time for everyone. But if you have the privilege to, 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 to nest, um, it's, it's really, it, it's it's a wonderfully uh, rare time to do that. I'm I'm already getting sentimental because this is going to pass pretty soon. I'm going to have to go back out again. I'm I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> out into the world. Um, so the next question is from Daniel Benson. Um, he said, "I wanted to ask a question relating to the po political dimension of your work. You talked about how you see yourself as co constituting an avant-garde." Past avant-garde movements tended to link their aesthetic work to explicitly political ends. How would you characterize the politics of your work in uncreative writing? Well, my idea was always that, you know, with uncreative writing, you could be any kind of writer that you wanted because you weren't really writing it. You were just reframing that which existed. By the way, this was all just Duchamp rehashed 101, you know, 100 years later. I mean, writing never, writing never did a Duchamp you know, the notion of appropriation, I'm not talking about cultural appropriation, but I'm talking about as a strategy, which in the art world is so absolutely exhausted, um, was never even tried. 
in, in writing. I thought that was really strange. I was sort of like, nobody did a Duchamp with writing. I think, honestly, I think I might've been the, the first person to ever do that. That and a, that and a you know, Metro card gets me on the subway, by the way. I'm, nobody's given me any, any awards for this great achievement. <laughs> However, um, uh, so, okay, so if I wanted to be a right-wing writer, I would appropriate um, a right-wing screed and, and reframe it as literature. If I wanted to be a left-wing writer, I could do that. If I wanted to be an apolitical writer, if I wanted to be a science fiction writer, if I wanted to be a romance writer, you know, I mean, I could be any writer that I wanted with these tools. Um, and I thought that was a very powerful um, situation. But now with the drive to real authenticity in writing, my, these ideas are very out of fashion. Uh, now everybody has to, you know, everybody has to be exactly what they are. And if you're not representing, you know, exactly who you are in, in that way, then, then, you know, you're gonna get hung culturally. Um, and I think that's like, again, I think that goes against the, uh, the, the, the network flow in which er if everything is cop copyable and pasteable. If you don't want it copied, don't put it out on the internet. It's, a, it's an unoriginality machine that we're all writing on and yet we're trying to be so original. And I just, you know, these, these, these you know, one plagiarism scandal after another where now you have to, you know, somebody steals something, they have to disavow it and apologize and get on Oprah and cry and beg for forgiveness and they get all their book contracts canceled. You know, in, in a time in which everything is copyable and pasteable. To me, we're like, like it, if you announce what you're doing, people are cool with it. If I, I've never been busted for, for plagiarism, all my work is plagiarized because I've announced that I'm a plagiarist. And everybody says, okay, that's the game. He's a plagiarist. You know, it's when you don't tell people what you're doing uh, that they get upset and they feel ripped off, and I, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't blame them. I, I you know, uh, I, however, you know, the, everybody's trying to get away with something, and I, I think that's that's a bad idea. Why don't we just admit that we live in a world of copy and paste, and that that it's going to it's going to get into our literature, and it may not all be original, and we may not even know where it came from, and that this is a cultural shared resource. But my the choosing of that material is going to make it personal, as this as personal as if I'm writing a story about my mother's cancer operation. You know, it's personal. You, we as artists try too hard to be expressive because everything that we do is expressive of who we are. We can't help it, okay? And you know, this goes back to Duchamp. Why was Duchamp so great? Because he was choosing the things that only Marcel Duchamp could choose. Um, and so I don't think we need to worry about expression. I don't think we need to worry about politics. I, you know, I think you, we can change, we can be who we aren't all the time. I, this, this, again, this, this, this uh, notion toward, toward, toward authenticity and you know, staking a claim, while I understand the people's need for it, I also think it's really working against uh, the medium. But then again, as I said, the medium is invisible for most people. So to me, it's just a bundle of, of really bad contradictions. I think we need to become more honest. Okay, I have one more question here. Um, so I'm just gonna read it. Um, spot on wide ranging analysis, but why call it a crisis for meaning making? Isn't it a shift to the affordances of the digital multimodal meaning makers, a shift in agency? I, can you read it again? I don't understand. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, maybe Mary, maybe I'll just let you ask the question, Mary, to clarify. Could, I'll unmute you. Are you there? Thank yes. you. Is the problem with writing? Uh huh. <laughs> Not, uh, can you hear me, uh, Kenneth? Yes, I, I just made the comment that it was a spot on, wide ranging uh, analysis, right? Um, but I, I was. Uh, wondering why you call it a crisis, right? Because um, you could just call it a shift, a historical shift, you know, uh, the affordances of the digital becoming uh, ubiquitous, a shift in agency, and then a gap between educational institutions, government institutions, art institutions in harnessing or preparing for engaging with that. Uh, so it's kind of more, he's uh, a moment in history that 
uh, you, people like you ring a bell about and describe, and then people like me who are educators and linguists say, yes, what, what do we have to change to address that? And that's where I think the missing, the missing link is. And uh, traditional institutions are very slow to hear that bell ringing. Well, yeah, I'm, 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 I don't know. I like rupture. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of a modernist. Uh, so I, you know, I, and I, 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 I love, I love, I'm also a bit of, tend to see things uh, a bit dramatically, but I really do feel that I've lived through a dramatic shift in my lifetime, as, as have you. Um, I, I remember that, you know, in the eighties, they made this thing, you know, this, this idea up called postmodernism. And I thought, you know, at that time, it seemed so great to deconstruct modernism. And then, you know, we're in the, you know, people still use that word that we're in a postmodern period. But for me, the shift comes with the digital. Modernism ends when, the, when this giant wall comes down called the digital. And then everything changes paradigmatically, you know, in, in, in such a rupture, like, like beyond modernism, beyond, beyond anything, um, that, that I tend to, I, I don't want to downplay it. I don't think it's a segue. I don't think it neatly kind of slid uh, from from the 20th, when I, and I really, you know, you can almost really mark, tag it onto onto the millennium, uh, onto the onto the, uh, the 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 change in the century. Um, it really came in and changed everything. Uh, I remember my father, you know, like uh, saying to me, when I grew up, uh, we just had radio, and he he said, and then and then television came in, and it blew my mind. Right, my father is a kid growing up in the 30s, listening to radio, and then in the 50s, they got a television. I remember thinking in the 80s, I thought, wow, that's so radical. I wonder if, you know, I, I, I can't imagine such a rupture in my lifetime because it was still the television era. And lo and behold, a few years later, a much greater rupture occurred, you know, that, that made, makes that one seem really tiny. So if I get, tend to get a little bit periodizing and dramatic about this, it, I really, I think, you know, honestly, I probably think that this change uh, is, is, is the biggest change of my, of my life. It's, it's marked, you know, it's marked, marked me and it's marked the culture in, in, in ways. Um, so that's, I've, I'm, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, but I think institutions and I think are, are really slow to, to recognize rupture. They don't like rupture. You know, nobody likes rupture. Artists love rupture. You know, theorists love rupture. But you know, they want to. They want to. You know, even this the rupture of the pandemic. Everybody wants to kind of think it's going. You know, this is this is the end. It's it, this is not the end. This is it's all going to go back to normal. I mean, they can't they can't deal with the notion of violence and and rupture and change. And you see that in all of the institutions coming. Don't worry, it'll be fine. It's not really going to be fine. And and you know that's the privilege of the of the philosopher. I think. Uh, a little bit of distance to 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 discuss that. I never want to downplay it. It's it's so hugely important to me. I, uh, so. Thank you, though. It's a really cool question. Well, look, th there is just um, one other post uh, that is that is in front of us right now. You know, which is this uh, artistic discourse of the post-internet, and in so many ways, the this this sort of post-internet boundary box is is recreating the same postmodern boundary box errors that occurred of misreading the transition and so in closing what I want to say is we need you to get out of your cocoon as quickly as you can and to get back out there and put your name on some big shiny books uh, and to make sure that we keep thinking critically uh, about um, what are our practices within digital spaces? What the pandemic, you know, if the digital is the rupture, I would build a case that this pandemic has really been the true expression of what digital living is in a certain sense. It's forced it upon us in so many ways and that we have lost the common space of communication. I, I loved your point before uh, um, because I've been saying something similar. Everybody that cries about Facebook blocking your, you know, truth is mad because it's a private space where they can 
make the rules however they like. It's not the public sphere. So to uh, us to even use these kinds of infrastructures as um, uh, uh, as as um, thinking of them as the social core of what the world that we want is is problematic. So um, I really, you know, I've been a big fan of all that you've done, all of your interventions, and I really hope that you keep on intervening and keep on pushing us all um, and helping create a better world. Um, so I really um, appreciate and thank you um, for your time. Um, and I think that's it for me. I'll give you the last word. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, normally we we finish this up and we we go have lunch, I guess now. Yeah. Or sort of yeah. lunch time or a little later, we'd have a beer together. And, yes. uh, you know, again, I, I, uh, this is, these are the kind of things uh, that we're missing. One last comment about post-internet, though, right before, yeah. I, and then, then I'll, I'll cut it off. Um, the post-internet was interesting because it was actually the time, it was an articulation of the time in which the medium finally becomes invisible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before p internet art had to address the code had to address the you know the the fact that it was you know that it was digital, at, at, and I think post internet art actually just you know kind of uh, they say that a medium really becomes useful when it becomes invisible, and I think that that was the articulation of of, of post internet art. Uh, so uh, I I think also like okay i'm gonna be here too long let me no, do it please do it do it please do it don't hold back i i mean there's oh very quickly um it's kind of like it used to be like what can the internet do and now i think the question more is like what what can the internet not do uh, yeah okay and and it's kind of like well the internet can't like do pottery like throw a pot and you know glaze ceramic thing, the internet can't do uh, art you know artisanal food, locavore food. Let's say the internet can't weave a beautiful you know textile, and in a funny way, like you know you see this now happening um, with books. If you go into a bookstore now, or you know like say an art bookstore, the books are better looking than they ever were. And that's because everybody got so tired of, of, of shitty PDFs that yeah. there a reaction for something more beautiful. You also have that with LPs and vinyl, 180 gram vinyl. You know, LPs are now like, you know, built in ways they used to be these flimsy, horrible things. And now they're, they're monuments. So I think that in a funny way, and of course that all is a reaction to the digital and all that stuff is being produced and distributed digitally. But I think probably that may be the real post internet Will be you know will be the actual um, the the the, re the reinvestigation and investment into the physical you know yeah. spaces and things like that. So I think you know it's not as black and white uh, as as it used to be. It used to be we were just you know every time we we're online we we're tied to a computer, and then when we we would get we would leave the computer at our desk and we go walk around the block. Now every time we leave we we leave with this and we're still on we're still on we're still on the web wherever we are. So it's an integration. I, I think finally to conclude, I think the, the, the people to read on this best are the situationists. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think the situationists really, really articulated mo the, the, the digital world uh, 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 with these phones and the investigation of psychogeography and the reinvestigation of the bodies into the urban spaces. Yeah. Um, I, I'm finding the situationists to be hugely useful in understanding. Yeah. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Okay. And, and we will grab a beer sometime soon. Oh, we will. We're, we will. I look forward to it. Okay, guys. Ciao. Bye. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.